Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz is on assignment tonight. On the show tonight. I think we're ready to move to phase five with the state next Friday, June 11th. It's the day so many people have longed for, but as Chicago and Illinois prepare to fully reopen, for some, it's also a source of anxiety. A massive buyout of a Chicago area medical supply company and more of the latest business headlines with cranes. It's a four letter word nobody wants to say. Get ready to never have to say the name Asian carp ever again. We explain why. I didn't plan on dating during COVID at all. And dating apps now allow users to share vaccination status. The outlook for new relationships as the state prepares to reopen. But first, some of today's top stories. It was another violent weekend in Chicago. 58 people were shot and five killed. According to Chicago police statistics, the number of people shot is up more than 20% compared with the same period in 2020. And homicides are up 5%. With two weeks left in the school year, teachers at three charter high schools hit the picket line. 34 teachers at Urban Prep Academies are striking over pay and allegations that the charter operator refused to provide some special education services. Urban Prep operates three predominantly black all-male schools in Bronzeville, Inglewood, and The Loop. The school is well known for its commitment to get 100% of seniors enrolled in colleges. And there's much more of this story on our website. The state and city of Chicago move closer to a full reopening on Friday as coronavirus metrics improve. Illinois health officials report more than 200 new cases of COVID-19 and 14 additional deaths. The total number of reported cases surpasses 1.385 million. The total number of deaths has been 22,963. And more than 5.5 million people are fully vaccinated in the state. Now, capacity limits and social distancing recommendations will be removed June 11th, but masks will still be required for everyone, even vaccinated people. That's on public transportation at airports, schools, hospitals, and other congregate settings. Friday's full reopening in Illinois means businesses, including entertainment venues and restaurants, will be able to operate at full capacity. It's a day many people have longed for, but if you're experiencing anxiety about a return to something like normal, you're not alone. Mental health experts say so-called reopening anxiety is real, widespread, and to be expected. Joining us now to tell us more is Dr. Adaronke Pedersen, instructor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Pedersen, thank you so much for joining us. So, thank you for having me. Given that so many people have looked forward to an end of the pandemic for so long, why might reopening um, and this return to normality trigger anxiety? You know, for the past 15 months, we've been in a heightened state of awareness about our surroundings, about who's around us, um, in making decisions about socialization. We've had to think, you know, five, six steps ahead of what we might have been doing prior to the pandemic. So I think it's only expected that after such a long period of in some ways an anxiety provoking, you know, circumstance and context that moving forward, there would be some apprehension, some anxiety for different reasons, certainly for different people. What are you seeing or hearing in your own practice? You know, patients, um, community members that I work with and some of the research work I do are talking about feeling anxious about being around people even when they know they're fully vaccinated and, and this sort of hesitancy um, when you're coming in close contact with people that even if you're not wearing masks should we hug should we you know embrace each other or should we still somewhat be socially distant so I think there is some level of you know I thought by this point you know people saying I thought by this point I'd just be you know completely ecstatic and happy and ready to you know come fully launch back into full socialization mode but there is hesitation there is you know anxiety and a heightened awareness, you know, that's still following us and lingering at this time. What would you say causes the most stress for some people? Is it, you know, a return to working in person, public transportation, going out to eat? I think a return to work seems to be coming up more and more because different organizations and employers are following different guidelines or practices in terms of within their own organization. And I think there's also a lot of 
commentary around this idea of could we have hybrid models? You know, people saying I've enjoyed not commuting an hour to work or, you know, a couple hours a day or the traffic that comes with coming into work. Or I don't exactly know what everyone has decided to do at my workplace. I'm not really sure if everyone around me is fully vaccinated. So I think I'm seeing a lot of people having hesitation around return to work. So we know that the pandemic has not impacted everyone equally. We know that uh, the disproportionate impacts have really been in the black and brown communities. And of course, there was the, the racial uh, reckoning uh, in, in social justice that's happened over the last year as well. What kind of stress or anxiety might those communities be facing as reopening progresses? So I'm so glad you brought up that question because I think it highlights the importance of the fact that our recovery might not look the same, certainly as individuals, but our recovery might not look the same as communities too. That there are different things that black communities have experienced, brown communities have experienced because of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 itself, but also because of this racial reckoning, you know, that we experienced in 2020 into 2021, and I hope continues to happen. But I, I do think that when it comes to things like racial trauma, that we have to think about the compounding effect that COVID-19 has had on us as a community, on Black people in particular, but also the fact that racial trauma we know based on research that has been done is something that can impact people on a physical level as well. What are some of the ways that you recommend uh, to people uh, as far as how to cope with their anxiety um, and how to know when they should seek professional help? Anxiety is certainly on a spectrum and even things like uh, feeling fatigued or emotionally distressed and something like depression. And so it's important that people are paying attention to when anxiety is starting to affect their day-to-day -day activities, when it's starting to affect your sleep, your appetite, and that in paying attention to that, you're taking preventative measures. So if that means taking a break from activities, you know, that induce that anxiety or causes you more stress. But if you start to notice that the symptoms of things like lack of sleep, tension in your body, body in your muscles, headaches, abdominal discomforts, so or stomach discomfort, that's just continuously happening to you, then that's the time to say, you know, let me talk to my primary care doctor if you don't have a therapist or a psychiatrist, but certainly don't let the stigma of mental health keep you from going and seeking help because that's the most important thing we can do in this recovery phase. And Dr. Patterson, you know, is it possible that one of the good things to come out of this pandemic might be a greater awareness of and empathy uh, for people who might be struggling with mental health issues? I'm certainly grateful that we're talking about mental health more and more. And I hope that we continue to do that because it has such an impact on us, not just in terms of our mental health itself, but like I mentioned earlier, in terms of our overall wellness, overall physical health. And so I hope that this is a time where people can look and reflect and say, you know, talking about my mental health doesn't mean I'm weak, doesn't mean there's something, you know, inherently wrong with me. All that it means is that I'm able to recognize. And in fact, it's a strength that you're able to recognize when you need help and get the support that you need. Okay, Dr. Adaranke Patterson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. A massive buyout of a Chicago area medical supply company. A push by airlines to reignite travel between Britain and the United States as the pandemic eases and why some job seekers are becoming increasingly hesitant to relocate for new opportunities. Here to go behind the headlines is Crane Chicago business editor and Wire. Welcome back, Ann. I see you're in the office uh, for the first time in a long time. So our first story today is about a leveraged buyout of the Northfield based medical supply company Medline. Just how big is this deal? Well, by some measures, Brandis, it's the largest leverage buyout in corporate history. We're talking about $34 billion that have changed hands, thereabouts. Um, not for the entire company, by the way, but for a majority stake in it. Uh, the founding uh, family of Medline Industries, the Mills clan, uh, will retain uh, uh, a role at the company. And uh, indeed, uh, this is a fourth generation company that's been run um, very much as a family enterprise from day one. 
However, uh, they have built themselves up into being a giant uh, in the medical supplies business. And another thing that makes this uh, kind of an unusual deal, though the, the details are still coming into focus, is that it seems that the private equity investors, Blackstone Group and Carlyle, uh, among others that are buying in, are doing so not so much to do the classic kind of efficiency squeeze that the private equity in industry is kind of notorious for. Instead, uh, they say that they want to grow this business, particularly internationally, and the Mills family's continued involvement probably ensures that that's going to happen. Now, we also know some airlines are pushing for a resumption of normal air travel between the U.S. and Britain, also as the pandemic eases in both countries. How significant would this be for the airline industry? Well, it would be huge. Uh, the London to New York route alone, Brandis, is thought of as, as the most lucrative uh, international corridor in the business. Um, that route alone generated a billion dollars in revenue uh, prior to the pandemic. So uh, the airline industry uh, united all of its rivals in the U.S. and its counterparts in the U.K. are all desperate to get regulators to reopen uh, that route uh, because not only do the airlines benefit, but so do the airports and all the ancillary businesses that feed off of that activity. So the, the, uh, the industry is getting together and uh, pushing regulators to say we're going to reopen this route uh, by July 4th uh, at the at the latest. Fourth of uh, July. So and we'll see how much leverage they have. And really quick before we let you go, and new surveys are showing that fewer people are choosing to relocate for their jobs. What's going on there? Well, it seems to be the one of the holdovers from the COVID era. Uh, Brandis, uh, uh, Challenger Gray and Christmas, a Chicago-based outplacement firm, just did a survey that showed that in 2020, only 5% of job seekers said that they were willing to relocate to take a new job. Uh, first three months of this year, about 4% said the same thing. Now, just in comparison, uh, in 2018, that number hovered more around 10%. So it seems clear that the work from home era has taught us some lessons about the, uh, the need to relocate or how important location may or may not be to some employers. Okay. Uh, Crane Chicago Business Editor Ann Dwyer, thanks so much as usual. Thank you, Brandis. Up next, a new name for an aquatic nuisance. Stay with us. It really is about community where we all come together. Chicago needs to make space for everyone. At the end of this month, Illinoisans will no longer have to hear the words Asian carp. After several years and hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars spent trying to keep them from the Great Lakes, how can that possibly be? And why does this news have environmentalists and the state's commercial fishing industry swimming in, or shall I say, leaping with optimism? Paris Schutz went to fish out the answers. Dirk Fusick is the purveyor of Dirk's Fish and Gourmet Shop. He says Asian carp may one day be more popular than tilapia. I think it's a better fish than tilapia. It's healthier than tilapia. Tilapia is omega-6 fish instead of an omega-3 fish, so you get a lot less benefits of health from tilapia. To prove his point, Fusick is grilling up some creative carp cuisine, from carp Cuban burgers to carp tacos to regular old smoked carp. But despite the accoutrement, the Asian carp is not yet a bestseller. I'm not making any money on it <laughs> at this point in time. As you may know, Asian carp are the leaping, invasive fish that have taken Illinois waterways by storm. Governments have spent hundreds of millions of dollars keeping them out of the Great Lakes for fear they could destroy the lake's ecosystem. But now, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources believes it may have found a fix and it costs next to nothing. They're going to change the fish's name. We're trying to make them, the name, more attractive so that people be, be more inclined to purchase these fish and try them and, and have them as table fare, have them for dinner. So what exactly is wrong with the name Asian carp? You made a face when you said carp, so. <laughs> a typical carp is a bottom feeder, a smelly, gooey fish that isn't appetizing to anyone. Asian carp, however, feed on plankton and are not like other carp. As far as uh, freshwater fish, if they're prepared right, probably 
about as good as it gets. We visited commercial fisherman Dave Buchanan and Clint Carter on a recent morning, hauling in 4,000 pounds worth of Asian carp and other fish in the Peoria Pool part of the Illinois River. Carter says he recently invested in a new boat and fishing equipment, hoping the name change leads to a coming boom in demand. It'll help, help us expand our business and concentrate on harvesting these fish. Right now, commercial fishermen get a government subsidy to fish Asian carp out of the Illinois River to help control a massive population that has moved in and taken over. Some of these fish are destined for fertilizer or other industrial uses, but others, especially the big head carp, could soon be on your dinner plate. That is, once they have an enticing new name. As for the criteria... Something simple, simple, simple and short, and not carp, <laughs> you know? And there is precedent for this. Chilean sea bass was initially called Patagonian toothfish. Orange ruffy, initially known as Pacific slimehead. After a typically productive day in the Peoria pool, Dave and Clint haul their load to Source Freshwater Company, a Peoria-based fish processor and distributor. Owner Roy Source says he pivoted his business nine months ago after 50 years distributing food and dry goods. He too is betting big on the name change. Right now we've already created probably 30 to 40 new jobs just in the first nine months, mainly through the fishermen. Source says the meat is lily white and plentiful, but there's one more impediment to culinary success. The one bad thing about carp is that it's bony and I can't give you an eight ounce boneless piece of carp. So it has to be processed into ground up into something. So it can be burgers, sausages, hot dogs, meatballs, taco meat, anything you could think of with ground meat. Which brings us back to our taste test. First, the carp burgers. Here we go, carpe diem. Very good. Next, the Asian carp fish taco. It's really, really good. And finally, smoked Asian carp. I mean, right. tastes like smoked fish. Right? And the reviews were mostly That's satisfactory among customers. The general impression I had were they, they were sort of throwaway fish, um, but it tastes fine. Illinois public officials will reveal the name change on June 29th, hoping seafood lovers protect Illinois waterways and the Great Lakes from an aggressive, invasive species by eating loads of it. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Shuts. I think Paris was into this story for the snacks. So by now, you're all probably wondering what exactly is the new name? Well, public officials say they have chosen something creative and fun, but they are keeping it under tight lock and key. As Paris said, they plan to reveal that new name for Asian carp on June 29th. Up next, the pandemic's impact on the future of dating. But first, a look at the weather. COVID-19 may have complicated the dating game, but Tinder says 2020 was its busiest year yet. Other dating apps also report an increase in use during the pandemic. Now, as the White House pushes for 70% of adults to be vaccinated by July 4th, dating app users can share their vaccination status online and access a variety of premium features when they do. Joining us to talk about dating during COVID is Bella Gandhi, founder of Smart Dating Academy. Welcome back, Bella. Thank you. Absolutely. How has the pandemic changed dating over this last year? It's changed a lot. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic is it's changed dating for the better. All of the apps have incorporated video into their interfaces, which has been game changing. So people were able to make connections even during lockdowns. And now our clients at Smart Dating Academy, they are mandated to keep doing video dates as an amazing pre-qualifier, which leads to less disappointing dates. Now, dating app use has increased over the past year, as we just said. I mean, it seems pretty obvious, but why have so many people flocked to these dating apps? 
I mean, 48% of American adults are single. That's 118 million adults per the census, right? And so when life unplugged and the pandemic unplugged it for us, no friends, no family, no fundraisers, no brunches, we had to stare at ourselves in the mirror. And for so many people, it brought on this, wow, I'm lonely. I want to meet new people. Maybe I want to meet the lid to my pot. And that drove people to numbers on the apps that have been unprecedented. Now, as you mentioned, virtual video dating has become a lot more common. Earlier today, we spoke with uh, Stephanie Mited, who got together with her current partner who lives in Ireland during the pandemic. She said they try to choose one central activity for every date. Let's listen. We really like playing games. Like some of our best dates have been literally, they have like online like puzzles you can put together and we'll just do that, put on some music and talk. There's some times where you're like, all right, we can either watch a movie, watch a show, play a game, or talk, or some combo of those. Bella, how have people made virtual dating and video chats uh, exciting and creative? So the first thing we tell people for first and second dates, keep it short and sweet. You don't need to do any more than 30 minutes. So doing some sort of a cocktail hour, you could mix up your favorite cocktail together and disclose recipes to each other. Uh, there's so many things. People have been cooking dinner together. It's been absolutely game changing and so much fun for people to develop those connections slowly and more organically. Now, we also spoke with Jasmine Jackson. She called herself a victim of virtual dating because of COVID. Uh, this year, she was catfished by a match. Let's listen. I show up to the restaurant and I'm on the phone. I'm like, okay, I'm here, but where are you? Because naturally I'm looking for someone who's a little bit taller in stature. Ooh, it was not him. It was not him. He was actually using his brother's pictures. Um, he was not 30. He was 36. He had been married twice and divorced, and he thought that that would be the best time to tell me in person so I could fall in love with his character. Oof, Jasmine did not get uh, what she was promised. How do, um, how do virtual dates help to sort of weed out bad matches or even catfishes? Well, the thing, if you're just using an online dating app, you get five or six photos and 200 characters, right? Barely a tweet and a half. But video brings it all to life. It takes what was 2D and it suddenly makes it three dimensional. So, and when else are you going to get a sneak peek into somebody's house, right? You can see what that person's background looks like. Is there crazy stuff in the back? So <laughs> I love video dating for a whole lot of reasons. Yeah, it's a good idea to keep an eye on what's going on in the background. So um, COVID also posed unique challenges to people trying to date. We spoke with Ava O'Malley, who says she found it difficult to strike a balance when trying to meet someone in person for the first time. It was very stressful for me, just like, not knowing like what if this person is not being completely honest, you know, with who they're spending time with and you know how safe they're being. It it was very stressful, but then you also don't want to like come off as like you don't trust them or come off as like you're being extremely skeptical of them and their behavior. So Bella, what challenges have you seen singles face uh, when dating this year? Well, after, you know, our advice was to a lot of outdoor dates. If, once you do a few pre-qualifying video dates, go for a walk, go for another walk, go to an outdoor restaurant. But at a certain point, options became so limited. And one of the things we tell people is try to stay out of each other's houses because you know what can happen if there's a couple bottles of wine, a couch, a bed. We want to keep things slow. So that was really a challenge during the pandemic is keeping people out of each other's houses and doing activities to really see if they could build those connections. So now that applications are allowing folks to share their vaccination status, how do you think that might affect the dating game? I think it's going to be great. I know a lot of the sites and apps are talking about offering little perks for people that show their vaccination badges. Like you can super like somebody, you get access to free premium content. And there's even talk about having filters for people that were vaccinated. I know we ran a poll at Smart Dating Academy two weeks ago when the White House made the announcement that they were going to partner with dating apps about how would you feel about how do you feel about dating singles that are vaccinated or not? And 66 people. 66 uh, percentage of the singles or the 66 percent of people that responded to our poll said that they wanted to date people that were vaccinated and they would preference those people whereas only one third said they didn't care so i think it's going to be a really interesting summer to see how this pans out okay and obviously we'll see how you know the pandemic has changed the future of dating 
as we get much farther down the line. But until then, uh, our thanks to Bella Gandhi for joining us. We appreciate it. And that's our show for this Monday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The FDA approves a new drug to treat Alzheimer's, even though critics aren't convinced it works. And from cornrows to three-strand braids, the art of hair braiding and why it's more than just a hairstyle. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm serving Chicago for 37 years.